We're back to summer scouting with the rookie big board with the 2023 quarterback class. Welcome back to the Rookie Big Board. I'm your host, Matt Higgs, the FF Educator, and I am excited to jump into summer scouting for the quarterbacks. We've done eight running backs. We've done eight wide receivers. And actually, through two parts, we're going to end up talking about 12 quarterbacks in this class. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing I was. Why are we learning about 12 quarterbacks here over the summer when we just saw the way that the NFL values quarterbacks in the 2022 NFL draft. And I got to tell you, that's what I thought going into it too. I told myself, just watch the top four or five guys, Matt, put out one episode. We're going to get a little bit of an overview of the class, but I have to tell you, as I watched those five guys, I said to myself, that doesn't really give a full perspective of this class. Let me watch one more guy. Actually, I should be watching these two more guys. And I just kept doing that until I got to 12. I finally cut myself off. So I decided we need two episodes. I'm going to break it down like this. The quarterbacks on this episode, we're going to go from bottom to top in terms of my evaluations for them. And these are going to be guys who are more often than not going to live in or near the pocket. And on the next episode, we're going to talk about guys who have a little bit more mobility, a little bit more athleticism, but maybe aren't as refined in the pocket. So that's kind of how we're going to break it down. Certainly the guys today can still scoot a little bit. We'll talk about that. And let's go ahead and start here with Keaton Slovis. Before I jump into Keaton Slovis, I want to let folks know about the Rookie Big Board. Listen, this is the time. This is the time to get in on the Rookie Big Board. It's just $3 a month. You get the full summer scouting evaluations. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see on this video, I'm looking off to the side because I am reading off the notes that you would have available to you. Go ahead and check it out. Patreon.com slash Rookie Big Board. Okay, commercial over. Let's go ahead and get into Keyed on Slovis. Now, I got to tell you, Slovis is a roller coaster. And Quite frankly, he's a well-documented roller coaster, but that roller coaster actually didn't start at USC. It started with his recruiting process. Slovis ends up being the 705th national recruit in the 2019 class. He was the 26th pro-rated player, 13th in the state of Arizona. Now, if you follow recruiting, which you probably do at least to some level if you're listening to this episode, and if you don't, that's why you're listening. Let's talk about it. You may be saying to yourself, that's kind of odd that USC took the 705th national player and the 26th pro-style quarterback in their class. Shouldn't USC be pulling higher recruits? They did. When Keaton Slovis committed to USC, he was actually a late riser in the process. He had a big senior year that boosted him up national recruiting. But Miller Moss was already committed and in the class. So Keaton Slovis' competitiveness comes out right away. He chose to go to USC which was much higher than the other offers he was debating, Hawaii, North Carolina State, New Mexico State, uh, Oregon State. Instead of taking one of those schools, he pushed himself to go to USC when they already had a quarterback commit in the class. And he ends up coming out and having a hot start at USC. He gets pushed up the depth chart through injuries and as a true freshman, tears it up. It's a, it was a true underdog story, and he had a lot of momentum and confidence coming off of that freshman season in 2019. 2020 was rough. 2021 was inconsistent with injury. So after three up-and-down seasons at USC, Keaton Slovis has now decided to transfer to Pitt. It's going to be really interesting to see what he's able to do in that Pitt offense. I have high hopes, but right now I'm proceeding with caution, and I'm going to talk about why. When I look at Keaton Slovis, I see somebody who has clean footwork, a good throwing motion, a clean release. Mechanics aren't necessarily the issue. He's comfortable working within the pocket under pressure. And despite lacking mobility, he is able to move around the pocket well. So he's not a statue, but he's not going to be tearing it up with rushing yards. Slovis at times is a poised passer that works through progressions well and can fit the ball in tight windows. He can be accurate while throwing off platform and he can execute designed runs when needed, but he can kind of be the architect of an offense. He can be a game manager, and I mean that in the best way. But when I look at Slovis, I see a lack of pure arm talent and athleticism. And when you lack arm talent and athleticism, it's an uphill battle for fantasy football relevancy. So I currently have him projected as a day three early pick in the NFL draft. I do think he could gain some momentum and end up a day two pick. But at the end of the day, we are going to have to proceed with caution in terms of his arm strength and in terms of his pure mobility. 
Next guy up here is somebody who may have a little bit less name recognition, but that's Devin Leary, the quarterback out of North Carolina State. Devin Leary is coming in at 6'1", 215. Those numbers will be important. We'll get back to them. As a recruit, Devin Leary was the 302nd national, 16th pro, and 8th overall recruit out of the state of New Jersey. He was from the 2018 class. He had 15 offers. North Carolina State, Baylor, Boston College, Coastal decides to go to North Carolina State. He was the New Jersey Gatorade Player of the Year in 2016, best overall athlete in the state of New Jersey. And I know they're not the hotbed of recruiting, but don't sleep on the ability of good players to come out of the state of New Jersey. They do produce football talent. Now, Devin Leary, I got to tell you, he is a fun tape evaluation. He's a prospect with a solid floor, but I'm not sure the upside is quite there. But let's talk about that floor. Leary's comfortable working within the pocket. We're talking good footwork. He stands tall under pressure. He's not afraid to step up and through the pocket to make a pass. He's a good pocket passer. He throws the ball with a pretty spiral and enough pop to get by in the short and midfield. He's got a tight throwing motion that allows, allows him to be a consistent passer with good ball placement. He displays the ability, despite not being an overly athletic quarterback, to maintain his accuracy while throwing off platform and on the run. He's a good decision maker. He's going to put the ball where his guys can get it, not where the defense can get it. Leary, though, has limited arm strength. And you, you see, he has to put a little bit of air behind the ball even to get it past 40 yards. And he lacks that athletic upside. So similar to Keaton Slovis here, we're lacking pure arm talent. We're lacking mobility. Now with Devin Leary, you're adding in a 6'1", 215 measurement. That's going to be a tough sell to NFL offenses, but I do think he's going to be selected in the 2023 NFL draft. And I have him projected as day three early. Devin Leary may end up being a guy that hangs around the league for a while as a second or third stringer, but that's not a knock on him. I think he's a good quarterback. And by the way, folks, you're going to see him put up some big numbers this year in college football. There's not as much ceiling with Devin Leary, but he's somebody you have to know about. All right, coming in next is Tanner McKee, the quarterback out of Stanford. Tanner McKee is a really interesting one. Remember how I said with Leary there was a lot of, of floor, not so much ceiling? Well, let's go ahead and flip that with Tanner McKee, which means he needs to be on your radar because when it comes to fantasy football, we're looking for players with upside, especially at the quarterback position. Tanner McKee was a four-star recruit, a high four-star recruit. He was 46 nationally in the 2018 class. 46 nationally, for folks who don't know, is just outside of five-star range. So we're talking about a quasi-five-star quarterback. He was the third overall pro quarterback in his class. 31 offers, including Arizona, Auburn, California, and the University of Florida. He will be 23 when he enters the NFL draft. It's taken Tanner McKee some time to get to this point. And you may even be asking yourself, why don't I know more about a player that was almost a five-star coming out just a few classes ago? And not only was he a high recruit, he has high height, 6'6", 226. I mean, we're talking about prototypical pocket passer size. He's got a large frame. He shows the ability to place the ball where it needs to be in the short midfield. He demonstrates the ability to lead wideouts with decent anticipation. Tanner McKee protects the ball almost to a fault because he is not going to put it in a spot where it can get jumped by a defensive back, but sometimes that means his wide receivers can't get to it either. He puts solid touch on the ball, and when we're talking about that frame, it means he's catching the eye of NFL front offices. You might see Tanner McKee in some first-round mock drafts. That's because the NFL is paying attention, but he's raw. He has awkward mechanics. Part of that is his size. At 6'6", there's always going to be some level of awkward mechanics, but his motion seems elongated even from his frame. He drops his arms into three quarters or even one half throws at times. It's a really unnecessary motion for a big passer. There is no need for him to be throwing three quarters, especially with the types of throws and angles that he's making at Stanford. He has jittery feet in the pocket, and I feel like he feels pressure at a higher level for somebody who spends most of his time in the pocket. I don't like that. If I have a pure pocket passer, I don't want him to feel pressure too easily. McKee lacks mobility or athleticism. He is a statue in the pocket. So I mentioned Slovis and Leary have some ability to navigate outside of the pocket. McKee, for the most part, is going to live in the pocket at the next level. Now, his recruiting pedigree and his size, like I mentioned, are going to have him on the radar of NFL front offices. But 
He's a risky pick. All right. He's somebody to watch. If you're playing in Devi leagues, you know, it, it's worth a, a, a cheap flyer shot, you know, a low auction bid. It's not worth going all in on Tanner McKee just yet. The upside is there, but it comes with a little bit of hesitation for me. Now, somebody who I've been talking about a ton over the last couple of years is Phil Dracovich out of Boston College. I got to tell you, I am still in on Phil Dracovich. I have him projected as a top 50 selection in that 20 to 50 overall range, day one late to day two mid. But let's, before we get into the recruiting profile, or before we get into how excited I am about him, let's do get into the recruiting profile. He was a four-star recruit, 83rd nationally, fourth dual threat out of his class. Now, I just told you we're talking about pocket passers. And Phil Dracovic comes in at 6'5", 226, but he was categorized as a dual threat coming out of high school. He's in the 2018 class. You may remember Phil Dracovic originally committed and enrolled at Notre Dame. But when he chose Notre Dame, he had 16 offers, including Alabama, including Clemson. He was a U.S. Army All-American Bowl participant. Phil Dracovic ends up transferring to Boston College, and that's when he really hit the scene. He starts here with a clean base and a consistent throwing motion, a really easy release. Sometimes with quarterbacks, you just watch them play and it looks easy. And with Djokovic, his throwing motion just feels so easy. He possesses a big arm and the ability to lead wideouts downfield with impressive accuracy. That ball placement applies to throws in, in the short and midfield as well. So he can really put that ball where it needs to be at all three levels of the field. The ball comes off his hand with a tight spiral, good pop. He's comfortable working within the pocket. He does feel pressure well, something I knocked Tanner McKee on. And he has the footwork to step up and through the pocket. He evades pass rushers within the pocket. And let's get back to this 6'5 player who can rush. He's not a pure rusher. He's not going to be that guy. But if you watch his tape, especially 2021 tape, he can scoot. Like, this man can move around the pocket. He's not uh, He's not just going to sit there and take a sack. You can run executed runs, uh, designed runs for him at the goal line. Like, Phil Dracovic has some level of creativity here for an offensive play caller. The problem is with Dracovic, we had that transfer from Notre Dame. 2021, he had a season-ending injury, so we really only have a season and a half of good tape on him. But with his size and his traits, he's going to be a riser. I don't think most folks have Phil Dracovic in their top five or six right now, but I think most folks will end up having Phil Dracovic as a relevant top five, top six fantasy football quarterback from this 2023 NFL draft class. All right, we have two quarterbacks left here that we're going to talk about on today's episode, and this next guy is actually number three in my rankings. So most folks know Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, that next guy up for me, just pushing that top tier, is Tyler Van Dyke. I think he's got the upside to get there, folks. He's a four-star recruit, 222nd national. He was the seventh pro recruit in his class. So, by the way, I keep saying this pro versus dual. If you're not familiar, 247 Sports ranks are, I should say, classifies recruits at the quarterback position in two different ways, either dual or or pro. If you're pro, you kind of fit more traditionally in this model that we're talking about today. Guys who are going to hang out in the pocket a little bit more. If you're a dual threat, it's exactly what it sounds like. You may have more rushing ability. So Tyler Van Dyke came out of the 2020 class out of the great state of Connecticut. Suffield Academy was the top overall recruit out of the state of Connecticut uh, in the 2020 cycle. He had 20 offers. BC, Cal, Colorado chooses Miami. He did participate in the opening finals and Elite 11, two really great competitions that you want to see a quarterback recruit in. Now, Tyler Van Dyke is a poised passer. He's got a big arm. It places him as the best of the rest, right? That's kind of that category. For most folks, it's Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, and then you're listening to episodes like this to try to figure out who's the best of the rest. That's Tyler Van Dyke for me. He is the ideal pocket passer for fantasy football players. He features a tremendous arm. He's going to push that ball 50 yards downfield effortlessly. He pairs that arm with the ability to place touch on his passes, adjust velocity as needed. He has good ball placement in the short and midfield and excellent ball placement in the deep field. Excellent ball placement in the deep field. 
That is not something you see often. Van Dyke leads his receivers with tremendous anticipation. He throws them into space. He's got a clean throwing motion. He features a consistent throwing platform, good footwork, a solid release. Now, it's a little bit slower of a release than you might see from other passers, but given his frame coming in at 6'4", the throwing motion is clean. It's good. Now, he feels pressure well. He does not panic in the pocket. Van Dyke will stand in there under pressure, get popped, and make a good throw while doing it. He makes good decisions. He protects the ball when throwing over the middle of the field. And Van Dyke, for somebody who doesn't have a ton of reps under him, is, is advanced in terms of his ability to check down on plays, understand when the play is over. He doesn't push it. He knows what he can do. And he knows what he shouldn't do. And that is an advanced level of maturity for a pass caller, especially one that's taken uh, not a significant amount of reps. Now, his biggest knock for fantasy football purposes will be limited athleticism. His large frame does stop him from being overly fluid or elusive, but he does have the ability to extend the pocket. He can scramble when needed, but he's not going to rack up rushing touchdowns at the next level. So that's the hesitation here with Tyler Van Dyke. That's what may end up allowing other prospects to leapfrog him. But at least for now in summer scouting here in July of 2022, Tyler Van Dyke is coming in at quarterback number three for me. And then coming in at quarterback number two right now is C.J. Stroud out of Ohio State. Now, it was tough with C.J. Stroud. You know, do I put him in the more pocket passer, more mobile argument? He's not really one or the other, but I kind of had to break the tie just the way the numbers broke out. And we had to split up Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. You knew I was going to do that, right? Let's get into the recruiting profile here for C.J. Stroud. A four-star recruit, 42nd nationally. Now, uh, C.J. Stroud actually jumped up later on in the recruiting cycle uh, because he won the Elite 11, which is like the ideal quarterback recruit competition for folks who may not be familiar with that. I'm kind of I'm simplifying that for folks who are familiar with the process, but Essentially, that's what we're looking at. He was in the opening finals, the All-America Bowl. He was the second overall pro quarterback in the 2020 class, fourth overall recruit out of the state of California. He had 19 offers, Georgia, Michigan, Baylor, among the top choices that were not Ohio State. But you had C.J. Stroud coming off of an Elite 11 finals, committing to Ohio State, and you kind of knew that he was going to be the next big thing in Devi, and that was going to translate over to the 2023 NFL Draft. Stroud has the mechanical foundation to develop into the top overall pick in the 2023 NFL draft. I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to run that back. CJ Stroud has the mechanical foundation to develop into the top overall pick in the 2023 NFL draft. That's not being hot takey. That's not just trying to, to, you know, give a little bit here at the end for CJ Stroud. I'm telling you, 6'3", 215, and what we're going to talk about, Stroud absolutely has the ability to leapfrog Bryce Young. We're going to talk about Bryce Young in the next episode and has the ability to be the top pick, even in a class that may feature Will Anderson or other defensive players as serious contenders for the top pick. Back to CJ Stroud. He's got a big arm, an effortless throwing motion. He can put the ball anywhere on the field. Anywhere on the field. C.J. Stroud can put the ball anywhere on the field. He possesses a tight throwing motion with good footwork and a good foundation. He consistently keeps his body closed. Good footwork, clean stance, right where you want it to be. He follows through on throws. It gives him the foundation to develop, and that's what I'm talking about. We're going to talk about weaknesses with C.J. Stroud, but when you have that mechanical foundation, when you have that throwing motion and that big arm, we can work with the rest. And that's what NFL coaches are going to think here. He displays high velocity on passes through the midfield. He's comfortable sitting in the pocket, even under pressure. He does have footwork and mobility to evade pass rushers when needed, but he's not going to bail on the pocket quickly. He's a, uh, he is a mobile enough quarterback, won't be a pure rusher. He won't be super elusive in the open field, but he will do damage outside of the pocket. C.J. Stroud's improvement needs to come with mental processing and decision-making. Now, I know what you're saying. If you follow this draft process year in and year out, you're saying, my goodness, C.J. Stroud sounds like an Ohio State quarterback, right? It's usually the mental side of the game that we have these question marks around these high recruits, big-armed, athletic quarterbacks from Ohio State. But Stroud does lock into pre-snap reads. Now, remember, too, C.J. Stroud's played one year of college football, and he's played with some really, really talented players around him. But he does lock into pre-snap reads too often. That might be the scheme. That might be what he's asked to do. 
His tape showed few examples of him working past the second read. Again, that's what his scheme asked him to do. This may be a result of the scheme, or it may be something that we need to watch as something as we progress, because you know he's going to be criticized about that at the next level. Either way, that development is going to be at the forefront of the conversation around C.J. Stroud, the mental processing, the decision-making. Stroud is a little bit too willing to throw the ball into tight windows and double coverage. I imagine that most quarterbacks in the country, though, would be more confident than they should be if they were throwing the ball to Jackson Smith and Jigba, Chris Olave, and Garrett Wilson, right? you It's understandable, but it still needs to be refined. He puts his targets in tough positions at times, and he will allow defensive backs to get in there and jump routes. So he needs to improve his anticipation. He needs to improve his processing. But there is so much upside here when it comes to C.J. Stroud. He's such a fun prospect. C.J. Stroud may carry the top of this class along with Bryce Young. But I hope this episode and the next one help you understand that there is more to this quarterback class than what we saw last year. There's depth. There's a good shot for four to eight guys going in the first two days of the NFL draft next year. In this group, C.J. Stroud, Tyler Van Dyke, Phil Dracovich, Tanner McKee, Devin Leary, Keaton Slovis are going to be a big part of it. I appreciate you checking out this episode of the Rookie Big Board. I appreciate you taking the time to check out all the resources at, at patreon.com slash rookie big board, dynasty rankings, Debbie rankings, 2023 rookie big board, discord access, folks, just $3 a month. If this summer scouting series is helping you, take the time, check it out for one month, give it a shot. I'd appreciate it. It helps me keep putting out this content. As always, I appreciate checking out this episode of the rookie big board.